If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those. Uh, we're going to be in John 4 together. We're going to read most of the chapter together. Uh, but, but just as you're turning your Bible there, there is uh, this picture of Jesus. Uh, I honestly wish I would have found it so we could put it on the screen. But um, in the picture, um, Jesus, is, he's got his hand on, on his like, chest and he's doing something like this with his hands and he's oddly white for a Jewish guy. His hair is blonde and it's feathered and he's got blue eyes and it's, he's like glowing. He, he's ethereal, right? He looks very, very spiritual. And if I'm honest, he doesn't look very helpful. <laughs> and, and what I mean by that, I'm not trying to be sacrilegious, but, but if Jesus is ethereal and clean and floating somewhere in the atmosphere and not on the ground in the brokenness, in the muck, in the mire, where it hurts, then I can learn some principles about him, but I don't know how to take those principles and get them on the ground where I am. See, if Jesus is just kind of ethereal and pretty and his hair is feathered and he's not in the blood and the mire with us, then I'm not sure he is of any help to us. And that's why the writer of the Gospel of John is trying to give us a picture of Jesus right in the middle of the griminess of life where you and I are living. He's not painting a picture of Jesus floating about like Tinkerbell in the atmosphere. Jesus is on the ground where it hurts. Are you tracking with me? He's like on the ground where it hurts. In fact, the great theme of the Bible, not just the gospel of John, but the great theme of the Bible is just a few words, right? God with us. That's the story. It's the story you're in. It's the story I'm in. If you look in Genesis at the garden, what is the garden except God with us? He's dwelling with his creation. Sin fractures that. God ransoms his people out of Egypt, establishes the tabernacle. For what reason? God with us. Then there was the building of the temple. And what was the point? God with us. And then Jesus puts on flesh and dwells among us. And what's the story? God with us with us. And then the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost after the ascension of Jesus Christ. And what's the story? God with us. And one day soon, the sky will crack open. Christ will return and God with us forever. It's the story of the Bible. And John wants us to have a front row seat to the scandalous nature of God's grace towards not those who've got their act together, not those who project that they've got it all figured out, but right into the middle of our wounds and our hurt and our pain. And that's where Jesus enters and that's where Jesus wants to work and that's what Jesus is after today. You tracking with me? Okay, now, uh, one of the points of Jesus coming, putting on flesh and dwelling among us, is that he would enter the brokenness of his creation. It's his creation. He's entering into the brokenness of that creation. In fact, if you've ever kind of wrestled with, because I used to wrestle with this, like why did they kill Jesus? Like if there was a guy who's just healing everybody's diseases, giving everybody free lunch, telling dead people to stop it, casting out demons, I mean, you would just think that guy, we, you just wouldn't kill that guy. You'd kill some other people. You're not killing that guy. And, and yet they did kill Jesus. Part of what's going on in the coming of Jesus, interacting with the brokenness of the world, is that people, specifically the fundamentalist of the day, not, not fundamentalist as though they believed the fundamental elements of the faith, but instead those who with kind of a rigid superiority felt their morality was better than others is that Jesus' compassion and care for the broken, marginalized, hurting, and not put together was offensive to them because they believed the honor due 
those that, that was being given to the broken and marginalized. They believed they deserved the attention that wasn't coming towards them. Let me give you some examples of this. This is, I know you're there in John 4. This is in Luke chapter 5. Uh, in Luke chapter 5, Jesus, um, he, he's um, showing kindness to a tax collector. Levi is his name. And I wish I had the time to get into how, seriously, how despicable a tax collector would have been in the first century. So let's be quick not to judge those who despise the tax collectors because it's hard to get the mind around the kind of perversion and depravity that would exist to make a man become a tax collector to begin with. And this is who Jesus is showing compassion to. And it frustrates the fundamentalist to no end. Let me read it. We'll pick it up in verse 30. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And then later on in Luke chapter 19, he's still trying to get across what all these miracles about, what his coming is about, what, what all these things that he's teaching are about. And he says this in Luke 19 verse 10, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. This was something that was unforgivable for the powers of his day. And then lastly, I know John 3.16 gets all the press, rightfully so, but I have always been drawn to John 3.17 that says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but rather to save the world from condemnation. So when Christ comes, he's not coming with more tablets. You with me? When Christ comes, he doesn't have new tablets, a new set of rules that you're gonna need to follow. He comes as the embodiment of those first tablets. Now, uh, you and I, we get a front row seat to all of this today. And I know some of you are like, man, I've read your bio. You haven't been to seminary. I'm not sure I trust you. And I'm fine with that. I'm going to let the word do the work. You with me? So with that said, with that said, let's dive into our text. We're going to be in John chapter four. I'm going to pick it up in verse one. We're going to read for a while and that's okay because, well, because this is the word of God. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. Now that little sentence is going to be key for where we're going. So if you write in your Bible or highlight in your device or anything like that, that's a pretty significant verse in or sentence or phrase in this chapter. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting behind the well and it was the sixth hour or about noon. Now let's chat for a second. My, my guess is that in your imagination, you have thought about Jesus. Like you've got some thoughts about what Jesus is like and, and how Jesus might act and what my guess is that nobody though, when they thinks about Jesus, thinks about Jesus like we just read about Jesus because the text says that Jesus was like, oh, I just need to find a place to sit down. I mean, you, you see in this passage, Jesus weary and worn out and desperate to sit down. So see, we've got Jesus in the grimy brokenness of the world. He didn't flitter about on his wings into this well. Wearied, exhausted, longing to sit down, he finds a seat. Now let's pick it up in verse seven. <clears throat> and a woman of Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given to you living water. And the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. 
The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. That just got awkward, didn't it? The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming. No, no, no. It is now here when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then the disciples came back, and they marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and were coming to him. Now we're going to skip this conversation with um, his disciples. It's not that it's not unimportant. It's just that what the point I want to make is, is actually in this relationship with a woman and her town. Look there in verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days and many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe for we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this indeed is the savior of the world. Now, a couple of things I just want to start to pull out of this text. The first is that sentence that we looked at right at the beginning, that th this idea of he had to go. Now, now that had to go is in the imperfect tense, which might not, you, you might not care about that, but it's significant for what's happening in the passage because the imperfect tense means that, that you literally translate it, he was having to go. Now, let me tell you why that's problematic because he wasn't having to go. This is not the only route to get where he is going. In fact, the way he chooses to go is the route that nobody wants to go. Most Jews would have not have taken this route. They would have gone around Samaria to avoid the Samaritans. The second thing is no one is forcing Jesus to go. This is not his disciples' idea. It's not somebody else saying. Jesus, the spirit-filled man, compelled by the Holy Spirit, has a divine appointment. And him having to go isn't about route. It isn't about some external power forcing its way into its life. It's him surrendering to the Holy Spirit that is guiding him to this divine appointment. And then let's, let's look back now at verse seven. A woman from Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, I mean, this is adventures in missing the point. And the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give them will become in them. This is huge, right? A spring of water welling up, bubbling up unto eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come back 
to draw this water. Now, one of the things that's happening in the gospel of John up until this point is Jesus is stepping into some Jewish promises and he's showing that he's greater than they are. He is the fulfillment of them. So uh, I'm going to very quickly move us through three chapters of John. Don't panic. We'll do it. Uh, We see that Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's happened already in the gospel of John. So no longer are you going to need lambs for the rest of your life to make sacrifice for your sin against a holy God. Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world once and for all. We've also already seen that Jesus is bringing the new wine of the kingdom of God that is more powerful than the Jewish rituals of purification so that there is a new wine that Christ has brung in his coming. We see also that there is no longer a physical temple needed, but rather we become the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. We become the temple. We make no pilgrimage in order to be right with God. Are you tracking with me? If you get a chance to go to the Holy Land, go drink it in, absorb it, be blown away by it, but God will not love you anymore. You're not required to go to some temple in a Holy Land to be made right. The Spirit of God dwells inside of you and Christ has come and says, you are the temple, you are the location, you are the dwelling place. You also see in his conversation with Nicodemus that now new life is born not of willpower or family lineage, but of ongoing belief and repentance. And then here we are at this well. And the promise is you can drink from this well, but you're going to be thirsty again. But I've got water that if you drink it, you won't be thirsty again. And there's several significant things uh, around Jacob's well. Um, Abraham made his first sacrifice to God not far from here. It's actually right around this area that the promise of land is given to the people of God. There's also these huge moments at the well, like Abraham's servant, find Rebecca, Isaac's future wife at this well. On top of that, Jacob met Rachel, his future wife, Moses met Zipporah, his future wife, all at this well. I know some of you are like, where's that well? <laughs> How does sister get to that well? Right? Like, like, this, like this is like, this is a spot, yo. I mean, this is a place where there are marriages happening. We've got one out back right after this is over. We'll head to Jacob's well together. But what's happening here is Jesus is continuing this teaching that he is the better than. That in all these other rituals, you were going to have to do them on repeat to stay pure, to stay right before God. But in his coming, you weren't going to have to over and over. There was going to be no more penance, no more series of checklists that he would become your righteousness. He would become in you a stream of living water bubbling up unto eternal life and she wants it. I mean, this is an awesome kind of easy conversion. Watch, see what happens. Look at verse 15. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here and draw water, play the keys, call out the invitation, get the people up front to write down this woman's information. I'm going to stick her in that baptism class, get her baptized and get her on our records. Right? Jesus, I got water. You drink that water. Eternal life bubbles up inside of you. Okay. Wait, wait. Okay. You ain't got no questions? No, no, no. I, give me that living water. And then if I, if I said, guess where Jesus goes next, and you didn't know the text, no one would guess where he goes next. In fact, it almost, it, like you kind of cringe when you read it. You don't want to pull Jesus aside and coach him. And he's like, yo, I mean, I know you're co-eternal with the Father and... You've always been and you'll always be and you're everywhere at once and everything was created by you and for you and through you. But man, I, why are you bringing up her husbands, man? You know, man, Jesus, listen, you, you got her, man. She won't give her the water. So, so watch what happens in verse 16. And Jesus said to her, like she said, give me the water. I want the water. I want streams of life to bubble up inside of me leading to eternal life. Give me that water. Jesus, verse 16. Okay. Go call your husband and come here. Uh, And the woman answered, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. You could call these five verses the wound and the worry. That's what you could call it. 
Um, Jesus is doing something here that seems on the surface to be cruel, but is actually one of the most beautiful, kind, amazing things he could ever do. And he shows in this moment that he actually loves this woman and doesn't despise her. He's showing. So the reality is in a fallen world, wounds abound. In fact, universally in this room, not one of you is outside the scope of a broken, fallen world, which means many of us have these deep kind of soul wounds that affect us in ways that most of the time we're not even aware of. And sometimes that's our own foolishness that caused that wound. Other times it's other people's foolishness that caused that wound. Other times still, uh, it can be just the nature of our flesh and our broken sinfulness that leads to this kind of broken, hiding, woundedness. And even when everything is awesome in your life, it can happen because the devil is a liar. My son turned 13 on November 4th. We had this rite of passage party for him. Like, like that's a, if, like your kid from 13 to 18 is gonna test you on some things, right? Gonna test your relationship with Jesus, gonna test your restraint, gonna test your wisdom, gonna test, right? Uh, and so what we wanna do is at 13, we just wanna call out the Jesus we see in them. And, and we want to call out not things they do, but these personality traits. We believe the Holy Spirit is, is kind of woven into them. And so we had this party on Saturday night. It was just adults. So you can imagine he loved that, right? 13 year old, bunch of grown ups at your party. But it, there, there were these men and women that are around him and are in his life. And we just took turns calling him up into what God has put in his heart. He's aggressive and that's great. We want him to be aggressive as long as it's tempered with gentleness and he's gentle and we want him to be gentle as long as it's tempered with that aggressiveness. We, we wanna call him into how God's designed him and how God's wired him and I needed to add a little something to the end of my, my last speech to him because I had a friend that did something similar to his 15 year old kid um, and when, when he was giving this speech about and God's got a call on your life and God's, that kid heard all of that through. I, I can never measure up to this. I will never be able to do this. And it crushed him and he rebelled against the Lord. And so I got to just look my son in his face and say, you're going to screw up bad. It's going to be embarrassing. You're going to feel deep, nauseous shame. Look at me. You're going to blow it. Not you might, you're going to, and you're going to want to hide and you're going to want to hide it from everybody. You're not going to want anybody to know. And I want you to know, we already know that it's going to happen and you need to come. You need to let us know. And if it's not me, buddy, you need to let somebody know because you don't fight the devil in the dark. You fight the devil in the dark, he'll knock you out. But if you pull him in the light, he, he, he can't fight as well in the light. So when it happens, son, not if it happens, but when it happens, son, we're here, we're your team, we're your guys. So I needed to add that so we would just know, hey, you're gonna blow it. And you're not surprising your earthly father and you're sure not surprising your heavenly father. Jesus knew what he was buying in the cross. Right? Like you're not surprising him. Right? You really think like, Jesus, like, oh gosh, now that I see it live in 2018, I regret everything. It's not happened. He knew what he was getting. What do you think the point of the cross is? Right? So Jesus says, go, go call your husband. Bring him here. Why? Because the way to experiencing the grace and mercy of God is through the wound. It's through the hurt. It's through the brokenness. It's through the struggle. It's through the addiction. It's through the foolishness. It's through the weakness. Look at me. It's not through the strength. It's not how this works. Do you not hear what Jesus said? The strong don't need a doctor. So, so how is Jesus? Jesus refuses to accept from this woman this weak, easy believism that does not touch and heal her deepest brokenness. Like, look, we don't know what happened to this woman. There's not a lot of information. Man, maybe, maybe she's been widowed five times, which explains that six dudes not saying yes. Can we not have that conversation? Like, I don't care how fine she is. If she's had five husbands and every one of them somehow died, I ain't saying I do. We can hang out, we can be friends. I'll encourage you in your walk with Jesus, but we ain't getting married. I ain't adding my, my name ain't gonna be on the list, all right? And the next story ain't gonna be, get your head, well, there's six and the seventh guy is now, you know, that ain't, that ain't gonna be the story. We, we don't, maybe she's an adulterer. All we know is that something has gone wrong here 
She's ashamed, which explains why she's at the, she's at the well at noon and not in the morning when she should have been there. She's hiding. This is tender. This is a wound. Do you, you understand the difference between a wound and a scar? Like if you touch a wound, you, you either pull back or you, you punch forward. If somebody touches you where it really, really hurts. And this is what Jesus has done. He, he leans in and he, and he touches on that wound. Get, get your husband. Go grab you. You want, you want streams of living water bubbling up unto eternal life? You, you want life? You want to never be thirsty again? Go grab your husband. He's still working that way in 2018. You want life bubbling up inside of you? You want to be set free? You want to, then, then bring your Tinder app and get in here. You want to be set free? Bring your porn addiction and get in here. You want to be free? Bring that eating disorder and get in here. You want to be free? Bring your self-harm and get in here. You want to be free? This is where Jesus goes. He doesn't go to, hey, be a better person. He says, bring that brokenness to me. Go grab it and bring it in here. And the great tragedy, God help us, is that we're spending a ton of energy trying to hide the very place that grace wants to break through. And so when you and I are like, God, I don't want anybody to know this because if anybody ever saw this, they would never look at me the same way. They would never consider me the same way. They would not, I've got to hide this. You condemn yourself to slavery when Jesus is like, I already know you're doing it. Get it in here. Get your husband, woman. I don't have one. I know. Sister, I know you don't. And I, I don't want to, you've got five. And man, the one you have now, it's not even your husband. I know, sis. Won't you, won't you bring it to me? Won't you bring it to me? And around that wound, so many of us are so self-protective that, that even when Jesus is beckoning that way, we just can't handle it. Like, right, it's just so intense like, can I just believe in John three sixteen and, and try to be a moral person? And that, listen to me, Jesus doesn't ask for that. He is not asking for a better version of you. That's not there. He wants you. Are you tracking with me? All of you, your brokenness, your foolishness, your stupidity, your addiction, that limp, that he wants it and he's asking you to bring it. And she's so well defended. She can't believe it. Just like we can't believe it. So look what she does. Gosh, it's just heartbreaking. First of all, let me, let me talk about this. Whatever makeup they put on me is sweated off. <laughs> I, I want to say this and then I want to talk to you about how it works. Listen, I'm so for you. In Passion 1997, the Holy Spirit of God blew me up in a room just like this and and changed the whole trajectory of my life. And although I will tell you that the majority of transformation that occurs in your life will take place over a period of decades, slowly, every once in a while, the Holy Ghost breaks through and changes everything. And I've been asking for months that that's what would happen today for you. So if you're addicted, you're stuck, you're broken, I'm pleading with you to hear, to be 99% known is to be unknown. To be 99% known is to be unknown. Now let me explain why that is. Because if you've got this 1% over here, right? Like you're 99% known. I love you. I'm in the word. You're in your home group. You're like, yeah, I struggle from time to time. I care too much. Man, I was up, man, I was read my Bible all night last night. I'm exhausted. I'm not, I'm not doing self-care well right now. Or every once in a while you're like, ah, man, I was I was on my feet and I just stumbled across something. You guys pray for me. And then, right, right, but, but in the end, if you've got that 1%, you've got that struggle, you've got that wound, you've got that addiction, you've got that, and you're, you're spending all this energy hiding it. It is impossible to receive love, affirmation, or grace from anyone because you will convince yourself that if they knew about this 1%, They would not love you if they knew about this 1%. They would not care for you if they knew about that 1%. They would reject you. And so you hide the 1% and you bury the 1% and it becomes, it becomes acidic in your soul and it eats away at your joy and it robs you from victory in Christ. And so Jesus is, is pressing on, I, probably for her it's not 1%, probably for her it's like 10, 15%, maybe 20, maybe 25, maybe 40, I don't know. And so she can't handle it, right? Like when we get down on that level, man, that's scary stuff. So she diverts, man. She does this, like she tries to juke Jesus, which you can't juke Jesus. He stays in his lane. Verse 19. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. 
yeah. I mean, he just straight read her mail, like deepest, darkest, most buried secret. And she's like, sir, I perceive, this is a total dodge, right? I want your heart, go grab your husband. So I'm gonna set you free. I know you don't, sister. I know you've had five. And the one you, I know all this pain, I see it. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Then watch what she does, just heartbreaking. Our fathers worship on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. She's dodging the pursuit of her heart with a doctrinal question. She's using theology to protect herself from Jesus freeing her heart. Now let's talk for a second because I don't want you to take something I just said and run. How you understand God matters. The word of God matters. Submission to the full counsel of God matters. But it is not uncommon for people to self-protect with doctrine. You can find very smart, very deep, very angry Christians And that doesn't make sense unless doctrine is being used to defend. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. So again, like he he does not soft pedal. Like he's not going, oh gosh, well, I don't wanna defend, I don't wanna offend her with what's true. He doesn't go, you know what, sis, let's worry about that later. Let's talk about that after you bring your, you bring your husbands. It's not what he does. He, he just says, hey, you worship what you don't know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. And then, he, and then he puts on top of that, not only does truth matter, but then he puts on top of that the gospel. Look at verse 23. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Now I love that last phrase. The Father is seeking people who will worship him because right now the Father is seeking this woman by the compulsion of Jesus Christ having to go through Samaria to meet this woman at this well, to ask for her husband, to enter into the wound, to set her free and call her into it. And it's all too much. So she tries to deflect one last time with a Hail Mary, not Catholicly, but football-y. And then she says this, and the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Look at verse 26. Goodness sakes. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Yeah, you can applaud that and I'm gonna try to explain why. The gospel of John is famous for several different things. One of those things are the great I am statements concerning Jesus Christ. And this is the first of those I am statements. And that means something, right? Uh, This is the first I am in a gospel full of I am's and it's granted to one whom at the time most readers would think was a three-pronged loser, right? She is a Samaritan, she is a woman and she is of ill repute. She is a disreputable Samaritan woman. And this is who gets the first I am. It is not Nicodemus in the previous chapter who is an elite ruling scholar of the day. It is not given to his disciples as just a gift when they left everything to follow him. The person who gets the first I am in the gospel of John is this Samaritan woman of disrepute who Jesus loved by going after the wound in her heart. In fact, what you see here is that it is incontestable that Jesus' living water is indeed anything other than a free gift completely independent of gender, nationality, or merit. And look at me, it is completely independent, look at me, of your past or your present. She has not repented. She has not gone and broke things off with this sugar daddy. She has not, she has done nothing at this point but hear and receive You see that? So some of you, I just want to let, some of you need to get over yourself. You're such a navel gazing Eeyore about how bad you suck and I'm just so terrible and I just keep screwing up and I keep, and I just want to shake you and say he knows. And this is what this is all about. You got to quit looking at you. 
You're always gonna disappoint you. Get your eyes up to the one who cannot and will not disappoint. So here, uh, I'll be 45 in June. I know I don't look it. I know I look like 26, but um, like, a, like I lived a very hard 26, right? Um, here's what, I, at, at 45, let, I'm just be honest, I thought I'd be farther along than I am. I thought I'd be farther along than I am. I thought I'd be freer than I am. I thought I'd be done with some of the struggles that I'm not done with. You're like, bro, that is not encouraging. No, 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 listen. No, no, no. Grace is for the journey. Grace is for the journey. Like, how do you think, look at me, how do you think God's affection works? God's delight in you. How do you, how do you think it works? Do you think God is like, you know, it's January 2nd or 3rd, whatever it is, and God's like up in heaven. He's looking down like, okay, so far. Man, they're at passion. Gosh, Spirit, did you know about that thing at Mercedes Benz? That's amazing. I'm gonna be sending you down to do some incredible things in that. Oh, look at that. They got up this morning. They actually, they might make it through the Bible this year. No, they do this every, I know. I know, I'm God. I, they, they might, they, they just might. I know. Lamentations is brutal. I know. Just do some work of illumination there. And they're gonna, and do you really believe that that day you don't, or that next time you blow it, or, or that next time that that wound flares again, that God's response is like, oh, golly, withdraw my presence, destroy, make them sick, burn their world to the ground. So here's what's hard. You're giggling, but a lot of you think that's exactly how he works, which is why you run from him when you screw up instead of running to him when you do. It's a sign of who actually understands the gospel and who doesn't. If you run to clean yourself up, oh, I gotta go take a spiritual shower. I gotta get away from holy things for a while until I kind of do good for a couple of weeks and then I can come back or I just need to wait till the next conference. Or anything. Man, that, that's a slavery that Christ has freed you from. It's a slavery that he's freed you from. It's just hard to believe. It's just hard to believe, which is why Jesus is here in the mud, in the blood, in the brokenness, in the hurt. That's why I asked for this woman's husband. It's not because he's cruel, but because he's unbelievably kind. And on top of all of this, look at verse 27. Just then his disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went into a town and said to people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of town uh, and were coming to him. And then we'll skip down to verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because his word. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this indeed is Savior of the world. Not only does Jesus meet this woman in her hurt, in her shame, in her wound, call her out of that, but then enjoy shame now lifted. She runs into town. Now who's she been hiding from? This town. Notice that once shame is gone, all of her brokenness and discrepancies become trophies of God's grace. You see that? I mean, this woman who's so embarrassed about that 1% who just can't have anybody, like so embarrassed that she's living the life of a hobbit, right? She's just kind of hiding and, and staying small and trying to keep away. Now, all of a sudden, she runs into town and she's running into town with the big boys. Come on, come and see the man who told me everything about myself. Now, look, can you imagine how cruel people would have been towards that loon? Well, there's... Five man, Cindy. If your name's Cindy, I apologize. I just pulled that from the air. Honestly, Mandy would have worked better. Five man, Mandy. Five man, Mandy's here. You know, here, here she is, you know, crazy. And who knows? She's out at the well again. You know, she's always out there by herself. Who knows what she's doing? She's probably hooking up with dudes out there. But there's something about the removal of shame that has transformed her that piques the curiosity. And, and did you track her message? She doesn't really have one, does she? <laughs> All she's got is her story. But, like, it's not like Jesus like, I need you to enroll in a training program. 
and then head back into town. I'm gonna need you to learn the Greek. I need you to have an answer for what the dinosaurs are all about. (laughs) Sister, I'm so glad we've got the shame off of you. I'm gonna need you to get a good answer for evil and suffering in the world. Mm -mm. Pull shame out of the 1%. And then she's free. And all the energy that went into hiding, all the energy that went into managing internal darkness is freed up for joy and praise. Like this little town gets converted by by this black widow, man killing maybe woman who simply had shame taken out of her heart by Jesus saying, you want streams of living water, okay, go grab your husband. So, so I want us to chat for just a couple of minutes here as my, my time starts to, to wrap up. Um, I'm, I'm not naive. I'm older, but I'm not naive. And so I am deeply aware that there across these four venues is a serious amount of duplicity. Not just normal duplicity. Do you understand what I mean by normal duplicity? Like whenever a lost person tells me, uh, just think Christians are hypocrites, my response is always, oh my gosh, we totally are. You should join us. You would fit right in with us. (laughs) I mean, you're inconsistent and you're, make sure you've got a good relationship before you do that, right? You don't want to just spring that out on your first coffee, right? But um, man, I I just totally want to agree we're inconsistent. And that's, that makes Jesus all the more amazing, not any less amazing. Right? I'm talking about a level of duplicity that's so devastating. I'm talking about you're here at Pat, you're taking notes, you even know when to lift your hands. Earlier, you're like, ah, right? <laughs> but you know, you, you know that you carry a deep sense of shame. You're well guarded. You've got 1%, 5%, 10%. You, you've got it. It's, it's in you and it gnaws at you. And it robs you of walking in the victory that Christ has come to give you. And it steals from you the joy of belonging to him. It steals from you the capacity to believe that he doesn't love some future version of you. But I want to encourage you. And here's how I want to encourage you. And maybe it'll work and maybe it won't. And I'll just trust the ghost. Um, If you're in here today and you would have a testimony that would say, there was a season of my life that I, I had 1%, 5%, 8%, 10%, 25%, 40%, whatever it was, that I was living a duplicitous life. I was either struggling with addiction, I was um, walking in ways that were inconsistent with a life surrender to Jesus Christ. And I hid it and I kept it quiet and I buried it. And, and then I buried the shovel that I buried it with and then I burned the dirt on top of the shovel that was buried over where I buried it. And by the grace of God, he called me out and I stepped into the line. And when I confessed it, I was met with grace and Jesus started to heal that place. I'm not all the way healed, but he started to heal that place. If that's your testimony at all, would you just lift your hand where where you are? That's my testimony. It's what the Lord blew me up on 97. So now keep your hands up. Now look around. Let me ask a question. Could it be that this is the Christian life? repeatedly coming back to him, repeatedly running back into his arms as he says, bring that to me. You want streams of living water? Bring that to me. Thank you. Why don't you put your hands down? See, I, I know what it's like to hold on to that as though it, it's the only thing that's keeping you alive. And if someone were to ever see that, if someone were to ever find out about that, that 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 kind of exposure for you is death. And I'm just trying to love you. No, 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 that kind of exposure is life. Now, now let's chat about this. There's some wisdom that needs to be had here. If you're walking and managing an internal, hidden, external darkness, right? You're suicidal, you self-harm, you, you are you know, swiping left and hooking up all over the place. You, you've just got a buddy that you kind of connect with. Um, you, you, you've got those kinds of things and nobody knows about it. I don't think that's a dear Facebook post. You tracking with me? 
Uh, I think that God has given you the good gift, I hope, of godly young men and women who are around you, maybe even some godly older men and women around you who are safe places for you to come and just go, I'm so embarrassed, but I can't do this anymore. Man, I am so embarrassed, but this is what I've been doing. This is what's going on that nobody knows about but me and maybe one or two others, and it is rotting me from the inside out. And I, and I want to encourage you. I, I want to encourage you. Look at me. You cannot out the cross of Christ. If you could, he'd still be in the grave. But because he was resurrected, it means the bill is paid in full. <laughs> I'm just laughing at that because that is awesome. So, so here's what we're going to do across the four locations. It's going to take some faith. But that shouldn't surprise you, right? You, you shouldn't be shocked at passion. You're like, wait, they want me to do faith? Yes. Here's what I want us to do. Why don't you just, wherever we are, let's just bow our heads, close our eyes. We're just going to take a second here. We're just going to let the Holy Spirit work. And I, I just want to let you know, there's going to take some boldness and it's going to take some faith. If as I've opened up the book today, and as we've considered Jesus's request, you, you want streams of living water? Go grab your husband. And that Jesus goes right after the wound, right after the brokenness, that the power of grace is unleashed. The power of victory is unleashed, not in these good things that we're trying to add to our lives, but rather when we bring Jesus into the brokenness itself. If you're in any of these venues and you're like, man, if I'm straight, not with you, Matt, gosh, you're in a different state. Or not with you, Matt, you don't know me. But if I'm honest with God right now, man, I've got a percentage and I wanna invite Jesus into that percentage, whatever that percentage is. Again, it's, it could be, I don't know what your husband is in this case. I just wanna invite you to be free. I just wanna invite you to bring him to Jesus so that streams of living water might burst forth into eternal, unto eternal life. You're not gonna get there through greater discipline. You're not gonna get there by memorizing a couple more verses. The path to freedom is through the wound. And so here's what I want you to do. It's crazy. It, 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 it's gonna require faith and boldness. If you're saying, I got a percentage, I wanna invite Jesus into that. Will you do me a favor? You just, regardless of what, okay, will you just lift your hand as high as it'll go? Don't do that Baptist costal thing. Get that thing all the way up, all right? Let's all be charismatics together today. All right, now here's, here's the second thing we're gonna do, and this is scarier. Uh, if you've got your, I want you to just stand up. Nobody knows what the percentage is. We don't know. I want you to just stand up. If you've got your hands up, just stand up. Whether you're um, in Atlanta, you're in DC, I want you to just stand up. Man, you've got a percentage. We're going to invite Jesus into this percentage. We're just going to ask him for freedom. We're going to ask him to enter this space and bring compassion and bring grace and bring life and bring freedom. Now, here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. And if it gets weird, then it gets weird. I don't want you to just cup your hands in front of you. Just, just form a little cup. And I, maybe you're like, I thought you were Baptist. I am. I'm just Bapticostal. I'm just a little different. I've got a smidge of the ghost in me. So we're, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna just we're gonna imagine that our little percentage is right there in our hands. And let's be honest, it's, it's ugly. I mean, it's gross. It's embarrassing. Wouldn't it be amazing if Jesus just entered our palm right now and, and took it out of our hands and replaced it with compassion and grace and life. And so I'm gonna lead us in prayer, but I want you to pray with me. I want, you to, I want you to think about what that percentage is in your hand. And I want you to think about how gross it is, how much you hate it, how much you'd like to be free from it. And I want you now to ask Jesus to come into that thing that you're holding in your hand and shine his light and his grace and his power on it. And I'm just gonna pray over you as you do that. Father, I bless these young men and women in the name of Jesus Christ. I don't know what's in their hands, but you do. 
and we're just standing up in front of a bunch of strangers and in front of you and just saying, we hate this thing. We hate it and we just don't know what to do with it. We feel trapped. We're embarrassed. And I thank you that you know. I thank you that you know what this is and you, you sent Matt here today to just bring it up so we could know that you know and that we might invite you in to remove it from our hands. You are greater than this thing. You are more lovely than this thing. We want to believe that. So will you help us, Spirit of the living God? Pray that you would embolden these brothers and sisters of mine to drag this thing into the light, this 1%, this 10%, this 20%, that they would bring others into the fight, that they would not try to fight the devil in the dark but that they might have trusted men and women and friends, that they might say, man, this is real and it's ugly and I hate it and I need help. And then they might be met with grace, might be met with accountability, might be met with power. I thank you that you don't ask us to figure this out on our own. You give us brothers and sisters. Thank you today for exposing in us what's been exposed. And I pray that you heal in ways that are beyond our imagination at this moment. Pray compulsions change. Minds are rewired. Hope is rekindled. And trust in your grace comes back into view. Thank you that you love us like we are, not how we one day will be. Again, we just praise you. It's not some future version of us that you love. It's not us when we finally figure all this out. It's it's now, right now. In the middle of all of this, we love you. Help us believe. It's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen. Love you guys.